So I love to observe people. Some people are far more interesting to observe. For me, the favorite person who observes myself. This often leads to one question. Why on earth did I do that? <laughs> For example, about 12 years ago, I had a midlife crisis. I had a 30th birthday. For me, that represented a change in age. I have those kinds of friends that badge you just a little bit about age. Uh, I think I received a birthday cake with 100 candles on it. And I said, uh, well, I climbed on the roof of my house. I don't know why I did that, but while on the top of my roof, I noticed in the backyard a trampoline. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I'll bet I could make that. <laughs> now what's interesting is I became completely oblivious to the fact that the trampoline sat nearly 25 feet from the house and that I was wearing cowboy boots. <laughs> Now, now, I don't have a picture of my broken ankle that occurred at the time, but I thought I would just show you one that happened three weeks ago. Some of the residual effects are still here. Why on earth did I do that? Now, I find it interesting also as I observe other people and compare them to myself, I wonder, why don't I do that? Re lately, this has kind of sent me on a trail to get a, gain a better understanding of the science of self-control. What is self-control? Self-control is a component of our brain that allows us to govern or control our thoughts, our emotions, our urges, and behavior. It's perhaps the single most important component of the human mind that allows us to live within laws, to govern our moral decisions, in fact, people that have increased self-control are also have better physical health, physical and mental health. They have way better coping skills, reduced aggression, superior academic performance. In addition to these outstanding characteristics, they also have a reduced abuse of drug and alcohol, reduced effects of eating disorders, and giving in to undesirable decisions. I'm going to use temptations to represent an undesirable decision that we do, that we don't necessarily want to do, but just for some reason, we do it. Now here's what's interesting. Is it possible that this component of our brain represents a limited resource? In other words, could we get tired? If we try to resist a temptation, will we wear out? and then be compromised? I want to talk about an interesting research done by scientists at Case Western in 1998 that involves chocolate, chocolate chip cookies. Whenever you read scientific literature about chocolate, you automatically become interested. I'm going to try to show you the design of the experiment. They used a variety of different undergraduate students. They enticed them with college credit, and they separated into groups. I'll outline the groups on here as follows. Group one, we'll call the control group, they were given an unsolvable puzzle, but they thought it was solvable. That's the trick of the psychologist. And they also made them hungry. They made them go without food. They put them in a room with no food and they said, solve this puzzle. The second group they brought into a different room. This room had chocolate chip cookies, but what's interesting is they baked the cookies in the room. So you've got hungry college students coming to a room that smells like freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. There's a plate of cookies. They've been fasting, and they say, do these puzzles and eat some cookies. The third group, which I'll call the radish group, they bring them into a separate room. It's been baked with chocolate chip cookies. The aroma's everywhere. You're starving, and they say, you need to eat three radishes, but don't touch the cookies. Now what are they interested in? They want to know how long the students will take on trying to solve the unsolvable puzzle. How many attempts, how long before they give up? Everybody wants to be a psychologist because this is what you get to do to people. <laughs> so here's the control group. The control group lasted 21 minutes and they made about 33 attempts before they gave up. 
If they were allowed to eat cookies, then you made it 19 minutes and you made 34 attempts. Statistically, that's no different. But the radish group quit after eight minutes, <laughs> making only 19 attempts. What was the conclusion? Simply stated, the act of resisting the temptation to eat the chocolate chip cookies came at a mental cost. In other words, by sitting in the room and trying to resist that temptation, they ran out of energy in their brains. They became compromised. Not only did it affect their self-control, it affected everything. Since that time, other researchers have said, have shown that when your self-control centers become depleted, you lose the ability to su suppress your stereotypes and prejudices. You have trouble coping with fears of dying. You can't control your spending. You can't really restrain from aggression, and you have a hard time controlling your intake of food. All of these because your self-control centers become compromised because they don't represent a limit, unlimited source of energy. Where does that leave us? Well, we have two options. We can either avoid the cookies altogether, or we learn to sit in the room, perhaps, and resist longer. I want to talk first about the easier of the two, which is avoidance. But before I do that, I want to break up temptations into two categories. I call them breaches, breaches in your self-control. We have outward breaches, which I'll start with. Outward breaches are things like overeating, smoking, pornography, Facebook, video games. This is not an exhaustive list, of course. There's a lot more than this. But these are represent temptations for some people. If you will, think of these as chocolate chip cookies. If you sit in a room with these things available, eventually, if you're trying to resist them, your brain's going to get tired and you're going to become compromised. How do you, how do you fix this? You avoid it. You get out of the room and you leave. You leave the cookies behind. That's the trick. As Benjamin Franklin observed, it is easier to prevent bad habits than to break them. Any of us that have tried to lose weight know it's way easier to keep the weight off than to try to take it off once you've gained it. Avoidance is our best defense against our outward breaches in our, se our self-control. However, as we mature from adolescence to adulthood, sometimes avoidance just isn't possible. Sometimes, when you're a youth, you partake in a substance that becomes a temptation, clear into adulthood, and you fight with it the rest of your life. Sometimes people force you into that type of situation, and sometimes you just choose to do it. This happened to me last week. Somebody mentioned to me, a friend of mine, a, one of those donuts that are covered with um, frosting, and they said they put bacon on it. And I thought, I first heard that and thought, that can't be good. But I thought about it for a week. <laughs> and then after about a week, my self-control centers were so exhausted, I went and bought one. And I ate it. And it was good. So <laughs> since that time, I think I've got about three days left until I go and do that again. <laughs> but what I want to talk about are inward breaches. These are a little bit trickier because these are buried deep within the emotional mind. Some examples, depression overanalyzing situations, panic attacks, pessimism, enmity, distrust, negativity, hopelessness. These are buried deep within the emotional mind. If you vision these as chocolate chip cookies, you can't just get up and leave the room. You can't leave them behind. They're attached to your hip. You always deal with the aroma. They're always there, and they can be debilitating on your self-control centers to where you start to be compromised in all of your cognitive function. So how do we do that? Is it possible to really strengthen our self-control centers of the brain? Science suggests, based on studying people from, with self-control issues, they vary widely in their ability to exhibit self-control. This variance suggests that you can indeed strengthen your centers for self-control. How do you do it? This next slide is very important to me. This is what I have distilled from the current brain research and the current research on self-control. Simply stated, self-control 
is strengthened by voluntary acts of willpower, not by involuntary acts of resisting temptation. I want to state this a number of ways. What's a voluntary act of willpower? Voluntary acts of willpower involve overriding our habitual or our natural self. For example, giving money away would be an example of a voluntary act of willpower. Going without food, doing an unselfish act for someone else. Not by resisting temptations. What I'm suggesting is self-control is synonymous with unselfish behavior. Paradoxically, the unselfish act does not have to be tied to the temptation. The unselfish act just has to be done consistently and daily. The same centers of your brain that light up when you're using your self-control are the same centers that light up when you're being unselfish. The same hormones that are released in your body, mainly oxytocin, when you're being unselfish, are the same hormones that are released when you're exhibiting self-control. In summary, if you want stronger self-control, if you want to increase your ability to resist, be unselfish, more unselfish. Thank you.